Yeah. Hello, hello there, and welcome back to Wolfen. Today I have a guest, Drakinifel, and he is a very interesting person on the wild field of the internet called YouTube. He has a fine little channel, and he uh, and you can find the link to his channel in the video description if you are interested in historical parts, especially about ships from the Age of Sail to the Ironclads to the First World War, the interwar period, Second World War, post-war era. And I found him there and I think it is very interesting to know some historical background. Very often we know a lot of stuff about tanks and planes and a little bit about ships. You know, there were the Hourglass, Yamato, Bismarck, the Bismarck was sunk, the Yamato was sunk and you know the our class was not and this is the most that people know but when it comes to the smaller ships which is unique to war thunder i think there is a lot of you know weaponry that we don't know um, about stabilization and uh, from auto cannons to cannons the shell types torpedoes and what is also at the moment unique uh, and about to come into the game mines the vs8 german premium which Gaijin will test it or does want to test it is not in the game yet but I hope that um, the historical background talk that I have with Drakinifel will clear kind of um, up some misunderstandings about mines, their origins, their development, use and all the things around them with some fairly funny parts and bits here and there. So um, I want to introduce you now Drakinifel. Hello there! Hello, thank you very much for that lovely introduction and hopefully today we will be able to give everyone a relatively brief breakdown on the history of those wonderful floating blobs of destruction in the sea known as mines. Okay, so mines. Um, when I think about mines it's just uh, egg, spicy egg, um, spiky egg rather, um, floating somewhere um, on the surface of the water and just waiting for a random ship to hit it and then kaboom. So how has this come to be? Okay, well the, the, the very first mines, they seem to have been developed as far as we would understand them actually in the Far East in Japan and China. Uh, back when they were effectively just a wooden box that somebody would seal up and stick a fuse on um, and some especially advanced models would have a, a flint lock or a, a wheel lock detonation mechanism but these obviously had to be used fairly close to the shore because they had to have a, a string or a cable attached to them so that you could uh, detonate it on command and this was effectively as about as far as naval mine technology advanced for several hundred years and uh, there, there were some attempts to use them in the Western uh, theatre so the English tried a few of them in the 1600s they didn't work very well the Americans tried some in the War of Independence and again they weren't really that much of an advance beyond uh, the Chinese and Japanese developments um, it was effectively just a barrel full of gunpowder with um, a small uh, mechanism designed to create a spark if it hit something and you just sling it in the water and it float down the river and hopefully hit something and explode. So nothing particularly um, technologically advanced as we would say uh, for uh, several hundred years right up until we get to the 19th century and uh, the first use of proper naval mines we see turning up around about the time of the Crimean War. Okay, um, so were, which kind of side was it that tested them first? Um, it, well, it was the Russians. Um, they, they'd they had some success using mines that were detonated by an electrical circuit. So these were still not mines really capable of detonating on their own. The idea was that you would seed a harbour or a river estuary or somewhere relatively important to you but close to the shoreline with a whole load of these mines and they would be connected by cable to the shore and you'd have your little circuit breaker or switch and when you flip that switch then the mine would detonate. So hopefully you remembered where you put your mines and then you could have a relatively unobtrusive ob observer um, on the shoreline and then when he saw that the ship was in the area where the mine was he'd flip a switch and one or more mines would explode and hopefully damage or sink the ship. 
Uh, there were some attempts to make, uh, again, contact detonation mines, which would allow you to deploy them far more widely and remove the need for cables and things that, like that that could snap. But the contact detonation mechanisms still weren't fantastic in terms of reliability. Okay. Uh, were they still floating on the surface? Had there some, some kind of uh, anchor um, to put them, to keep them in place? Yes, they were anchored. Um, the anchors didn't work all that well, to be honest. An awful lot of them uh, would uh, slip their anchors during periods of storm conditions and things like that. Generally, they were floating on the surface or just below it, um, partly so that if you knew where they were, you could look out for them, and partly because uh, their explosive charge wasn't that great. It was maybe the equivalent of 10 to 15 kilograms of gunpowder, which is a lot if you're standing next to it, but isn't actually all that much when you're going after a several thousand ton ship of the line, um, if it explodes more than, say, two, three meters away. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So was it kind of successful, those first attempts, or was it just, you know, the first well-documented kind of try? Some of them were successful. Um, it led to the first successful mining of a ship in history, at least as far as we can have uh, established records for, which was uh, the small survey ship HMS Merlin, which hit a mine and uh, detonated, albeit that even a ship the size of the Merlin wasn't severely inconvenienced, and they immediately went off looking to find out uh, if there were any more in the area. This actually led to a rather amusing incident in the Crimean War, um, where after a number of ships had taken hits and some damage from the Russian mines, the Royal Navy went and found a few more and brought them on board. And in a classic case of perhaps a mixture of arrogance and not exactly knowing what they were uh, handling, they took two mines and they sent one to the commander of the fleet and they sent one to the second in command of the fleet because of course sending large explosives designed to sink an entire ship is exactly what you do to your command staff um, and they had a look at it and uh, one of them well but actually believe it or not both of them decided that they were going to test the detonation mechanism on the mine um, yeah the mentality of that I can't even begin to fathom uh, one one of the officers was lucky enough that they had deactivated the actual explosive component of the mine, but he ended up with a face full of the mild acid used in the detonator for his troubles because it just squirted him. Um, the other officer was slightly less lucky. Uh, his mine hadn't been successfully disarmed, and so on right on the deck of his flagship, he literally exploded a naval mine in his face deliberately. Somehow he actually survived, although several people nearby were killed. And that's probably down to the fact that the explosive charge just wasn't that great. <laughs> well, that is kind of amusing, yes. Um, not for the people involved, um, I guess. But so how did it continue with the mines? How? Um, how long did it take before they came into like large scale use and um, at which point did they change the, the size to being terrifying and being feared and also kind of how much resources did they require compared to a torpedo or you know um, um, uh, building a ship with um, you know an artillery gun on it trying to gun down an enemy ship so how efficient were they before the First World War? Okay, well, f funnily enough, they they would become a lot more efficient and deadly, rather contrary to the British hopes, because after those uh, those two incidents and a few examinations of some additional mines, uh, the British admirals actually wrote back to uh, the the Admiralty back at home and said, well, we, per we have examined these weapons and now we are confident that we know exactly how they work and they will not trouble us or anyone else in the future, which was, it it's right up there with the, the most colossally wrong statements in the history of naval warfare. But a lot of powers is and effectively everyone but Britain um, noticed the effect of the mines because even though the mines in the Crimean War weren't especially effective, just the fact that they were present to a certain degree controlled the, uh, the how much the British fleet could exercise its power in and around the, the, the Russian coastline. 
and being able to disrupt the the enemy, especially when your enemy is so large, like the British Navy at the time, that you couldn't hope to disrupt it in any other way, um, was a big draw for people. And mines were relatively cheap. The, the very first ones had been expensive, but as with all technologies, once the the method of making them and uh, how to use them is understood, the cost starts to come down because you can mass produce them and you're not having to pay for the research and development. Uh, the next big use of mines was in the American Civil War, uh, which wasn't that that much longer after the Crimean War. And they were they were more effective there. They had been refined and they were actually called torpedoes for a significant part of the 19th century, which is very confusing to people if they're trying to research the difference between torpedoes and mines. So at, um, at one battle in the American Civil War, you have the American Admiral David Farragut, Farragut at the Battle of Mobile Bay. He supposedly says, damn the torpedoes, full speed ahead. And a lot of people look at that and go, well, hang on a minute, I'm pretty sure torpedoes, as we understand them, weren't invented up at that point. And they're right, they weren't. But what he was actually referring to was what we would understand as a naval mine. Um, so the, the, those mines were a bit more effective. You, you, you always have to ask whether the, the so-called spar torpedo is a mine or a torpedo, because it's not technically self-propelled, it's propelled by a ship or a you know, submarine that's uh, stuck on the other end um, and in itself is static. But the uh, submarine, the Confederate submarine Hunley used one to sink the USS Housatonic um, and a number of other mines, as uh, as with uh, Farragut's quote, they were con considered dangerous um, in the American Civil War and a couple of other ships were sunk, one example being the USS Cairo, which was one of the early ironclads. It was uh, an American ironclad monitor uh, gunboat, and it it was not that heavily armoured as armoured ships go, um, but it still was a relatively advanced warship, but it hit a mine and sank in 1862. 1862, okay. So yeah. that will, there will be still quite a bit time left up until to the beginning of the First World War. What happened in the time between what is kind of, or what is kind of interesting? So what, what happened was basically everyone started looking at how do you make these things more effective? How do you, uh, how do you weaponize them beyond the reach of just a, a very small bit of harbor defense? And one of the key developments for this period was in the 1870s, just after the American Civil War, the so-called Hertz Horn. Um, and this effectively replaced all the mechanical and other methods of uh, detonation for most mines, apart from a few uh, wired mines, which were still kept for harbour defence. And the Hertz Horn is, ex is exactly the reason why the classic image of a naval mine, as you mentioned at the beginning, is this sort of round ball with lots of spikes on it because each of those spikes is a horn um one of these hertz horns and it's not it's not actually any kind of uh sort of mechanical plunger or switch um each of those horns is actually lead and inside is a, a little glass vial filled with acid and when a ship hits the mine it crushes the horn and that obviously releases the acid the acid runs down into the into the mine and there is a lead acid battery kind of like the batteries you get for a long you've had for a long time in cars without the acid and when the acid drips on the on the battery it then creates a current that, and that current initiates the detonation of the mine um, so that's one of the reasons so that slight delay is actually one of the reasons why um, when you see a lot of movies one of the things they actually get right is ships will hit the mine and then there'll be this split second before it actually detonates uh, which is what uh, uh, the battery being completed by the acid and then obviously detonating. So with that in effect, they actually had the ability to drop off mines anywhere and rely that on the fact that they would work for a good few years at least. Okay. Yeah, that's uh, interesting. And um, so that was then the standard at the beginning of the First World War, right? 
Yeah, that that was pretty much the standard. As I said, they they still had um, harbour defence mines, which were rigged up to cables on the shore, because obviously you've got a lot of your own ships passing through the area, so you don't want to accidentally sink your own vessels. But for the more aggressive use of mines off the enemy coast and for denying um, passages of seaway, like, say, the English Channel or the Dardanelles or the Jade Estuary, um, these contact mines were pretty much uh, the best thing that they could get their hands on. And this is also when you started to see them not necessarily floating on the surface. Uh, it did make them easier to find, which was obviously a mark against. So it, in an effort to reduce that, they were anchored below the surface because now it meant that any part of the ship's hull, uh, right down to the bottom, um, could actually detonate the mine. Okay. Uh, and obviously it works against submarines as well. So you you began to see what was called the antenna mine, um, which was basically a mine that had a, it had a little float that went up to the surface with a with a cable, and the mine could actually be quite deep, but the contact of a steel hull or with a copper wire would cause a slight voltage because of all the salt water in the sea, um, and that could be used to either detonate the mine in place or to release the mine from where it was anchored lower down and then it would float up and presumably hit whatever um, had just contacted the cable. Okay, so when I look at some charts of the First World War, we see that on the, uh, you know, on the UK side and on the um, practically all around the North Sea, you see those huge minefields. So how quickly were they deployed when, you know, the conflict actually got momentum? And um, how do you actually clean them up? So minesweeping. So for deployment, there, there's a number of methods. At the time of the First World War, the, the two main methods were either by submarine, which um, you could you could in theory fire them out torpedo tubes, but that was very risky, and the torpedo tubes themselves weren't that big. So mine laying submarines tended to have them on racks uh, mounted to the side of the uh, pressure hull of the submarine and then they could then launch those. So obviously that was a bit more covert, um, but you could also just chuck them off the back of ships, um, which was which was fine. Um, so as long as you could manufacture them in bulk, which obviously at that point had become a bit industrial and was quite easy to do, then you could deploy the mine, you could deploy a minefield very quickly because the, the key thing is once that minefield is in place, even if it's only got a few dozen mines in it, it becomes very, very difficult for an enemy to justify the risk of sailing through there because he has no idea where those mines are. And even an entire shipload of mines, maybe 50, 60 mines, will have cost in terms of uh, sort of the relative cost of a battleship or a cruiser has cost practically nothing. So even if you've got a 90% chance of your ship making it through the minefield, that 10% chance that you might hit a mine that cost a few dozen pounds or maybe a few Reichsmarks and you lose your multi-million pound battleship, that's not a risk that anyone could easily justify. Um, and obviously as the minefields intensify um, in density, they get more and more effective. So there's almost two kinds of minefield. There's the minefield where you kind of say, well, this is an area I have deployed mines in, or the enemy knows that you have deployed mines in. And you don't have to have that minefield too dense because its main purpose is a deterrent. Um, alternatively, you have other minefields which are actively, you're actively trying to block ships coming through those minefields you have to do a lot more densely, um, especially for stopping things like U-boats. Mines were dense minefields were actually very good at stopping uh, U-boats. So a significant number in World War One were lost to them, although obviously they, they would continue to chance uh, running through. A lot of lessons from the, for World War One had been taken from the Russo-Japanese War, where uh, the, Jap the Russians had lost quite a number of, of their ships to mines, and the Japanese also lost ships to mines. The Japanese actually lost more ships to Russian mines than they did to the Russian Navy. Okay, so the thing about minefields, how big were mines at the beginning of World War Two, and stayed they at that size, uh, or became they bigger or more efficient? And how what and what was actually the the high explosive filling? Was it just TNT, or was it some special high explosive material? <laughs> 
Um, well, explosives varied basically depending on who was manufacturing them. They could be as simple as gunpowder, they could be um, more energetic and slightly more unstable materials. Um, you could have gun cotton, cordite, lidite, um, mixtures of the above. Some, there were a few TNT ones as well. Uh, in terms of size, the average mine was about, should we say, about five or six foot high. Um, so what's that about two meters? So, um, the average sea mine is about the size of a, at the time is about the size of what to, today we'd consider to be a small hatchback car. So that they're not inconsiderable weapons. They do uh, at this point they are carrying quite the explosive charge. So how much kilos? Um, they'd be depending on the, exactly the size of mine. You could be. Uh, maybe between half a ton and three or four tons for the for a mine uh with an explosive charge somewhere between 50 and several hundred kilograms of explosive again depending on exactly the size and uh and weight of the mine yeah so were mines then the one hit wonder or kind of i mean they hit underwater and so the flooding for a ship regardless of the size is kind of significant so when a ship got hit um, by such a, you know, let's call it big charge, um, the hole is quite significant because it's under the armored belt, if I remember correctly. So how many mines did it uh, take to sink a capital ship? Or was it really like depending where it hit? It, it, it depended greatly um, on the size of the ship. I mean, if a destroyer ran into a mine, a, a significant naval mine, you'd probably be looking at that destroyer being blown in half um, in the worst case scenario. But the thing is, a lot of uh, naval warships at the time actually weren't designed with that much in the way of underwater protection because mines and torpedoes, um, very much like aircraft in World War II, had only really just come into their own. And so they they, as a weapon, they weren't particularly well understood, they weren't particularly an well anticipated for, and obviously going into World War One, you have ships that were built 10, 15, 20 years before the war broke out. Um, so even if the latest ships had uh, protection against them, the older ships didn't. So we see that at, um, during the Gallipoli campaign, quite a number of uh, uh, French and British crew dreadnoughts, as well as being torpedoed and shelled, um, a number are actually sunk by mines, um, usually only one or two. And the, the biggest naval victory for the uh, high seas fleet, for the Imperial German Navy at the time, in terms of prestige, is actually the sinking of the super dreadnought battleship HMS Audacious, um, which was a King George V class. So at the, and that's not the World War II era one, that's the older, older class. But at the time, that it was sunk, it, the King George V class was the third most powerful dreadnought battleship class in the Royal Navy, second only to the Queen Elizabeth's and the Iron Dukes. And one of those extremely advanced, extremely powerful battleships was actually sunk right near the beginning of the war by a single mine um, in October 1914. Yeah. Basically, down to, I mean, partly it was due to poor damage control, but also it was just down to the fact, as I said, that they they weren't really built to withstand uh, that kind of hit and um yeah it, it took a it took a single mine hit it took quite a while for it to go down but eventually it did go down and uh, the royal navy was down uh, sort of two three million pounds worth of battleship in exchange for a mine that probably had cost not more than a couple of days salary for a, a regular seaman hmm. so um, there is actually a tragic story for the German captain behind this, if I remember correctly. Um, um, what was it? Why didn't he get awarded anything for that? Um, so the, the mine layer in question was the um, SS Berlin, which was, uh, it used to be a passenger liner, but it was brought into service as an auxiliary cruiser and it laid 200 mines uh, near the Grand Fleet uh, anchorage. And uh, the Grand Fleet anchorage at the time wasn't scab of flow. Um, they had been stationed uh, elsewhere because of the, they were, they were 
worried actually, ironically enough, about another underwater weapon. They'd realised scapper flow at the beginning of World War One wasn't actually very well protected against U-boat attacks, which is possibly something they should have learned uh, or at least kept in mind for World War Two. Um, but so that they were they were stationed elsewhere. The Berlin sailed near them um, at night, dropped 200 mines, as we said, in, into the ocean. And a few days after that, the Grand Fleet sailed into the minefield and bang, there went uh, the Audacious. Now, as far as the uh, captain was concerned, partly the, sorry, partly part of the issue was that um, there were transatlantic liners going through the area and bearing in mind the kind of the general outcry you had later on in the war when the Lusitania was sunk um, once it became known that there were mines in this area the British government did play up the fact that um, these things being very indiscriminate weapons could quite easily have sent a, a liner full of innocent women and children to the bottom um, which would obviously have caused a massive diplomatic incident. Um, I don't know whether or not that would have triggered an early entry by other neutral parties into the war. Maybe, maybe not. But either way, it was the it was a it was a bit of a propaganda coup for the British because they could play this up whilst at the same time um, actually classifying the sinking of the Audacious. So. Uh, for a, for a long period of time, all that ever came out of that incident was actually propaganda that was favourable to the British and uh, looked bad for Germany. Whereas uh, the material victory that the Germans had actually scored wasn't even known to them for a good long while. Hmm. Well, that's kind of interesting as well. Now, when we talk about the protection of ships that you just mentioned, at which point became it um, known that, you know, mines pose such a big threat? And how did those countermeasures look like? And how did they work out? And were ships actually at some point maybe retrofitted to get up to the standards, like expensive, you know, dreadnoughts, super dreadnoughts that did this not have in their um, original drawings, um, could they be retrofitted? Yeah, so so in terms of getting rid of them, because the mines uh, at the time were still, as we said, they're either just command detonated or contact detonated, as long as you could spot them or in some other way find them, as long as you didn't whack them really hard, then you could, in theory, carefully collect them and take them away to be uh, got rid of elsewhere. So the initial minesweepers uh, developed in World War I, most of them were actually things like convert, converted fishing trawlers, basically ships that didn't have uh, very much draft, so they were very unlikely to hit a mine that wasn't right on the surface. Um, they could maneuver fairly uh, at, with a fair bit degree of agility at low speed, um, and they were used to towing large um, large items outside of the ship, obviously in normal life of uh, fishing net, um, but they developed what were called mine sweeps, hence the word mine sweeper. Um, and the idea was effectively to to have sailed through an area that you where you knew there were mines and the mine sweeps would cut the cables that the mines were attached to and gather the mines gently in towards the mine sweeper where they could be dealt with. Obviously, um, more specialized minesweepers with better minesweeps were, were developed as the war went on. Okay. And for the, the ships themselves, did they get any underwater protection? Yeah, uh, there, there wasn't a lot they could do for the ships that had already been built at the time because that kind of, the kind of refit you would be talking about would be considerable and would take it out of out of sort of the active war effort for uh, for quite a while some of the later ships like the queen elizabeth class had already been designed with a certain degree of um anti-underwater explosive protection in mind but obviously they needed they needed to have more and what you would see at the end of world war one the ships that survived both the war and then the subsequent naval treaties uh, a lot of them would go into dock to get refits and a lot of these refits would involve putting big bulges down the sides of the ship um, and th these bulges were basically designed to be well dual dual purpose anti-mine and anti-torpedo protection um, obviously when you're refitting a ship there's a limited amount that you can do but effectively those were to provide extra space between the hull of the ship and 
any explosive that might detonate, which would obviously help, help to dissipate the explosion um, and reduce its effect on the on the main hull and therefore hopefully stem the leaks. Later on, obviously, as, as newer ships were, were built, these kind of underwater protection systems were then designed into them from the start. And how effective were they? They had varying degrees of effectiveness because for obvious reasons, navies were not especially keen on putting large amounts of explosive next to a modern warship and detonating it to see what would happen. And that was because it was a relatively new field. That was basically the, the main way you could learn about the effects. Um, they did try some tests with old ships, um, which obviously <laughs> not, not necessarily quite as reliable because it's older technology and a different layout. Um, but after the, after the first few revealed that unsurprisingly if you detonate a large amount of explosive next to say a pre-dreadnought the pre-dreadnought just sinks and then you can't investigate how it sank um they started to do scale model testing to determine the effects and eventually you ended up with protection systems that were then rated against a certain degree of explosive um usually gunpowder equivalent explosive so you you, you would say have a system that where someone would say, well, we think this system will safely guard the ship against a uh, explosive warhead of up to 350 kilograms or, or something like that. Um, the, the two problems there were obviously one, then people can just make mines that have a bigger explosive charge, um, or two, especially as technology progressed, people could start making mines with an explosive charge that used a more energetic explosive so if you if you've designed a, a a system that can protect you against 350 kilos of say gun cotton if someone puts a much more energetic explosive um like say in world war ii something like torpex um or something like that then that explosive because it's got a lot more energy in it a 350 kilogram torpex mine um would breach the breach the protection that the, that ship had enjoyed even though the mine visually wouldn't have changed anything in terms of shape or size. So effectiveness varied. And obviously there was a, there was a degree of diminishing returns because you something like a destroyer was always going to be vulnerable to mines because you can't afford to put the, the, the sheer size of bulge that you need on a destroyer. Cruisers could have some protection, but not much. And then obviously once you get up to battleships, you could fit the most protection because they were the largest and could sustain the biggest bulges. Um, but even then, protection systems varied in there because there were all sorts of different ideas about how you should do it the italians had some very interesting ones yeah okay then the question is um after the war was over the first world war how long did it t take um all the um, participants let's put it that way into mine sweeping and were all the mines caught or did some break loose and did you have kind of some unintended you know victims to mines um, well, everybody had done a relatively good job of charting where their minefields were after the, uh, during the war for the, mainly for the purposes of not running into them themselves. So they knew where the mines were. Um, so there was a big, a very big mine sweeping effort immediately after the war to, to get rid of them. And that was mostly successful, but, um, one they were never going to get them all because obviously they didn't have things like gps so they didn't have the exact location of each mine and secondly um a lot of mines did have this annoying habit of uh separating from their cables in rough weather so you even today do get world war one mines randomly washing up on beaches or being encountered in the middle of the north sea where they've wandered for nearly 100 years now um some of them, disturbingly enough, are still actually viable. Um, but most of them, although still having explosives, seem to be inert, uh, which is a small blessing, especially when you consider you might go down to a beach on, uh, say, the, uh, the British uh, East Coast one day and just find a sort of five-ton German contact mine randomly on the beach after a storm. Uh, not really pleasant. Um, moving to the interwar period, were there some crazy developments um, up to the Second World War or was it just, you know, uh, improving what you had? 
for most of the war, uh, for most of the interwar period, it was a case of just improving on what you had um, with uh, sort of better explosives, longer, longer um, duration uh, triggers that would sort of last four or five years instead of two or three years, etc. Um, right towards the end of the interwar period, in the late 1930s, though, um, a lot of thinking was going into how you could advance technology. And kind of the late 1930s was very much a sort of a technological leap in military capabilities across the board. But one of the major uh, factors was actually magnetic mines. Um, now, and also like magnetic torpedoes, these didn't actually require you to hit them. Um, they could be triggered by the magnetic field generated by a ship. Uh, because obviously a ship is a, is a steel entity um, in water, so it is going to have a magnetic signature. Uh, the Germans were a very, very big proponent of these, and they developed uh, ship, ship dropped, uh, U-boat deployed, and also aircraft parachute dropped magnetic mines. And the wonderful thing about these things is they, they, they could float a lot deeper, so they were a lot harder to sweep. And they also benefited from the effect that modern torpedoes use, which is that if you detonate a large enough amount of explosive underneath a ship, you can actually do a lot more damage to a ship than you would if you just detonated that amount of explosive next to the hull, because you create a big pocket of air and uh, obviously an upwelling of explosive force. And this can actually break the ship's back, break the keel and sink the ship outright. Um, pretty much instantaneously, whereas if you say put that same amount of explosive next to the hull, because the water is a lot denser than air, most of the explosive force would be channeled into the hull, so you'd end up with a hole in the ship, but that hole, although it might sink the ship eventually, um, wouldn't have quite the catastrophic damage on a large target that um, this kind of backbreaking effect could do. And in initially there was obviously a bit of play with that, because some of the mines weren't powerful enough, some of them were too deep and some of them were uh some of them were um just uh were, um they went off too late or too early because obviously the magnetic field is was all around so the british were clued in during the initial part of world war ii when they found all these ships coming in with weird sort of broken keels buckled hull plating etc which they, then informed them obviously this was a proximity detonation rather than a direct contact detonation so it required the magnetic field to be strong enough and um, yeah and that leads me now to a few questions because i remember seeing and reading a few things first of all i remember this picture of a wellington with a weird circle around it and i think um, they try to kind of simulate a magnetic field and flying at very low altitude to sweep this kind of mines um yeah how effective was it and how dangerous was it for the plane well believe it or not that was actually kind of the mark ii version of the attempts to sweep magnetic mines um the very first versions um actually used the, the, the first attempt sorry they used either low-flying aircraft or ships that didn't have a large magnetic signature say like wooden hull ships to actually just tow a gigantic electromagnet through the water um, obviously, this is not ideal. So the next stage up was this massive, as you say, massive hoop that was attached to a Wellington bomber, um, which was effectively, again, just a gigantic electromagnet. And the idea was that by generating this huge magnetic field, but flying along at several hundred miles an hour, low to the uh, surface of the sea, you could set off these magnetic mines safely because uh, obviously the Wellington being in the air and going very fast, by the time the thing exploded, it would have been long gone uh, and and then you would be safe. The one problem with it is, although it worked fantastically well if it passed over a mine, um, you couldn't really necessarily say that the whole area was safe because the field generated by the Wellington was obviously a relatively small comparative to the area of the ocean that may or may not contain mines. So you could you could clear a very sh sh small strip and then you had to find some way of telling the ships that actually this is this is your one safe passage and then just hope there's not a random one floating around. Um, 
the alternative obviously is then to get lots of them and do m- multiple sweeps back and forth but that's a lot more effort and a lot more resources okay um so it, it it's kind of it, it was the solution the eventual solution that was more commonly used was what were called degaussing coils um and these were basically um attached to ships and they were a way of reducing or nullifying the magnetic signature of the ship entirely. So that was um, already kind of this uh, countermeasure uh, for the detonator. Yeah, it, yeah. Um, it was obviously it was expensive to do and you had to hope that it actually worked. Um, but it, it, it was a it was a more effective solution per ship than sort of the big UFO looking Wellington. The only problem was it meant you actually had to pull every single ship you wanted to be so protected into harbour and into dock and actually fit it with this degaussing coil, um, which, okay, for things like your battleships and your heavy cruisers, you could definitely justify doing, but for the tens of thousands of small merchant ships sailing around, it's not really ever going to happen. Yeah, and going back to the um, um, effect of the magnetic field, in Norway... Um, when the Germans in, invaded Norway, um, they had a lot of problems with their magnetic detonators on their torpedoes. Had they also problems with the with the mines because of the magnetic field of the Earth being weird uh, um, at around you know the Norwegian coast? Yeah, well, I mean, this is the thing: the magnetic field of a ship uh, passing along the ocean is actually generated by the interaction of the ferrous metals in the ship with the earth's magnetic field so the uh, magnetic field obviously which is measured in gauss um is very tiny um you're talking about milli gauss worth of um of magnetic influence so you had to tune the detonators very very carefully uh, because if they were too sensitive then they could go off just if they were really 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 sensitive that you could theoretically have them randomly exploding from things like the change in the Earth's magnetic field due to solar activity. Um, if you had them just a little bit less sensitive, you'd basically have to run into the mine to explode it, at which point you're back to the old contact detonation anyway. Um, and as you mentioned, there, there was this problem with the fact that as you go further north, the Earth's magnetic field gets stronger. Um, which means that you have to start upping the sensitivity. Uh, so you have to decrease the sensitivity of your mine because otherwise just the Earth's magnetic field will detonate it. Um, and it's, it's these kind of environmental variables that led to problems. So yeah, the, the magnetic mines in the north, until they learned to control for it, um, did have some similar problems to torpedoes. Okay. So how did they actually drop those mines? Um, how did they activate the detonator without getting it uh, off on the ship itself that is supposed to drop those mines? So uh, m- most of the detonators you could set to have a remote activation just on a simple timer. Um, the to, to drop them off from a ship was usually fairly simple. You, you see a lot of mine layers, they're just a bunch of uh, mine launching rails going over the stern. You'd have them all stacked on the <laughs> ship. Um, you, you'd activate the timer to, to set when they became active and chuck them off the back. Um, if you're looking at an aerial model, then you'd have a, a, a similar kind of much shorter timer, and then you'd chuck them out the bomb bay. Um, and they'd parachute down into the sea okay. and then they, they, they would be set for it to sink to a certain depth before um, stabilizing. Okay, so when we look at the European theater, um, we had the Baltic Sea of, uh, with the Russian Navy versus the German Navy. And uh, you had obviously the English Channel and the North Sea and uh, also the Biscaya. Um, at least that's the German word. I hope it's the same mm-hmm. in, in English. So I think it was more or less the same like in the First World War. It, what, in terms of their usage? Yeah. So overall, the, the layout of the minefields and uh, maybe a few more were dropped by, by aircraft. But uh, in general, I think um, it was very stationary. 
were there any attempts to maybe do a bombing raid and drop some of them into the shipping lane into the harbor while you know everybody was everybody's attention was drawn to you know the bombs blowing up randomly in the in a city or a harbor yeah so um the british didn't use quite the same level of mine lane that they did in the first world war uh, they relied a lot more on aircraft and shipping to interdict germany um but obviously there were defensive minefields in and around each uh, both sides harbors but as you as you suggest the germans especially um pioneered the idea of these parachute mines um so an awful lot of them were dropped into the thames estuary um the solent which is this area of portsmouth and the english channel and this kind of offensive mine laying allowed for uh, a lot more effect give for the given number of mines because if you think about it if you're flying out in over the atlantic and you have drop half a dozen mines it's entirely possible that they could float in the water for 50 years and nobody would ever come anywhere near them whereas if you fly over the thames estuary it's not even a mile wide at its uh, as it begins to narrow down into the river thames itself so if you can drop half a dozen parachute mines into there you've got an awful lot more ships going through a very confined area and you can near enough guarantee that someone's going to be unlucky enough to hit them and if you sink a ship uh, in this uh, shipping lane i think that's a lot of um, that's raising a lot of problems yeah and and even in even if you don't sink a sink a ship the fact that you're known to be doing it means that the Uh, your enemy has to commit to mine sweeping efforts and extensive and consistent mine sweeping efforts, as well as trying to degauss as many ships as possible. So it's actually putting a lot of uh, a lot more strain on the enemy's war effort, even if you don't sink a single ship, because they've got every time you drop so much as a single mine, they've got to treat the entire area as if it's covered in mines until they can find and eliminate them. Um, and then, obviously, as you say, if, if you do manage to sink a ship in in a sort of a closed environment like that it, that's a major problem um because it's going to be blocking the shipping channels um and it's going to disrupt all the incoming ships and outgoing ships for quite a while hmm. then the next thing that i'm interested in uh, or i think that is very interesting um combining now the the anti um anti mine efforts and building protection into the ships when there was the channel dash by the Scharnhorst and Gneisenau in particular both ships mm. were hit with mines how extensive was the damage and how well did the anti um, underwater charge protection work um, well the the underwater uh, protection of Scharnhorst and Gneisenau obviously it, it it functioned a lot better than the underwater protection of ships in World War One um the mine the mines that they hit were significantly more advanced than the ones that than the well than the one that has had sunk the audacious um back in uh, the first world war um but they they did take a fair bit of damage um when they when they hit these uh, these mines the uh, royal air force had done a lot of parachute mine laying itself because with Jean Horst and Eisenhower on the French West Coast, they were fairly certain they'd be coming up there at some point. Um, but when, when they were actually hit, um, bear in mind the Germans did have minesweepers with, with the uh, forces that went up the channel. So a, a number of mines were swept um, and they tried to avoid known minesweepers as well. Um, But when when the when both when uh, both Sean Horse and Gneisenau were hit, they both of them would have to stop when they hit the mines, obviously to um, try and shore up the, the the damage they'd taken. But in general, uh, it it worked relatively well. Um, so Sean Horst, when it hit a mine, it didn't act, the first mine it hit, it didn't actually stop for that long, and was back up to speed fairly um, fairly quickly. Whereas um, then when it hit the second mine, it took a while to uh, to get back up to speed because obviously it's got more damage. Um, the first hit on Nisenhow was a little, was weird actually, because it did less physical damage than the one to Scharnhorst because the mine actually blew up a fair distance away from the ship. It was a non-optimal explosion. But what it did do was it knocked one of the ship's turbines out of action 
so it was stopped for longer than Scharnhorst. Um, for some reason, although Scharnhorst had hit its second mine ahead of Neisenhower, when uh, the Neisenhower got back up to speed, it promptly sailed through exactly the same area where Scharnhorst had hit its second mine and rather unsurprisingly hit another mine. Um, that actually stopped the end, both of the engines and crippled the steering uh, and took quite a while to get to get it um, back up and active. A lot of it's down to exactly where uh, they were hit because both ships hit a couple of mines, but Scharnhorst was repaired relatively easily and obviously was back in service and sent up to Norway. Um, whereas Neisenhower, both of its mine hits seem to have been concentrated in the engine area. And obviously the engine area is quite a large part of the ship. There's lots of open spaces that you can't really do much about. Um, and uh, as you probably know, it, it never sailed again after that because the damage uh, was bad enough to keep it in harbour um, until it until such time as it became really impractical to repair it as the war progressed. Okay, so moving on to the American coast, did the Germans ever mm -hmm. try to lay some uh, to lay some mines there with some of the long range uh, submarines? You know, because um, there the big convoys gathered to then go uh, over the Atlantic, and uh, how well were the protections? Um, just you know, with a few quick words in the American harbors against such uh, efforts or attempts? Well, the American coastal defenses, um, especially at the start of uh, their involvement in the war, were, were very minimal. Um, but the although the U-boats had great success with torpedoes um, off the American coast initially, they didn't try to use mines so much because one of the, one of the great things about um, using mines in European waters, especially around the UK, is the relatively confined space. Whereas off the US coast, um, although there's a lot of coastline, there's also a lot of ocean. Um, and the, the Kriegsmarine were very aware of the fact that if they tried to deploy mines in any great quantity, the instant that a ship hit a mine, it would be very easy for the Americans to just redirect their shipping around that area because they could just keep redirecting them further and further out into the Atlantic and it wasn't really going to 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 inconvenience them all that much um, so that there weren't too many German mines if any off the American coast um, it was it was and to be honest that especially at the beginning it was much easier just to torpedo ships as they came along because as I say there, there wasn't really a convoy system or any form of escort um, the the main reason that mines were used in such large numbers over torpedoes was because you couldn't get a U-boat or a torpedo boat, an E-boat or something into somewhere like the Thames Estuary, but you could get a, a U-boat off the US coast, so better to do the direct damage with an, a, with an aimed shot from a torpedo. Um, although the Germans did at the time, they were testing out um, additional uh, mine detonation types because with the uh, degaussing coils and degaussing machines that the British had developed to counteract their magnetic mines, they'd actually gone on to develop uh, pressure sensitive mines. So and those mines can't be countered because the, they relied on the uh, slight increase in pressure caused by a ship going past to detonate and there's nothing that you can do to change that without, <laughs> well, a, a ship was always going to weigh something. Um, so they had pressure activated mines and um, acoustic mines were developed by both sides as well during the war. It was it was always a game of counter, counter and counter again. Okay, and how was the situation in the Pacific? I mean, you know, the water is deep, the ocean is big, a lot of island hopping going on, um, but also a fair amount of strategic points. Um, one question before that. Did the Japanese ever consider, you know, at least being annoying with mining um, some of the strategic harbor? Let's say, um, um, you know, um, where they attacked the Americans first in Pearl Harbor. Um, well, the main problem with trying to go after somewhere like Pearl Harbor was just physically getting there. It, it stretched the um, Japanese fleet to the limit to pull off the actual Pearl Harbor attacks. Um, and it, it, it was kind of a six of one, half dozen of the other situation in that, yes, if you could mine the approaches to Pearl Harbor, it would be incredibly effective against the American fleet. Um, on the other hand, 
that was pretty much the only strategic location that they could mine as far as the American American um, coastline itself was concerned. And the Americans were perfectly aware of that. So they had a lot of mine sweeping efforts in and around Pearl Harbor, which effectively would negate any, any real attempt to mine that area. But there were a lot of mines deployed in on the western side of the Pacific. Um, so by, by both sides. Um, because, as you say, there, there were a lot of strategic choke points around the islands there. There were a lot of um, shallow waters and passages which could be fairly easily mined. Um, the Americans did fairly well deploying mines and sweeping them. The Japanese did deploy a fair number of mines, but their mine sweeping efforts were pretty terrible. Um, they, sim similar to their anti-submarine warfare um, system as well N neither their mine sweeping nor their anti-submarine warfare were particularly effective throughout the war um partly due to cultural issues in the imperial japanese navy um so they were a lot more vulnerable to it so how effective how effective were mines that the uh, americans laid because when we think about japan it always uh, is about you know the resources and that they had a similar resource situations than the germans but then I came across like the uh, Japanese had a lot of resources, um, especially from Japan, um, no, from China, but they simply couldn't bring them to Japan because of the uh, submarine blockade and um, I guess also a lot of mines um, in the uh, sea between the Japanese and the Chinese coast. Yeah, so, so the... Um... The American minesweeping effort was highly effective, although it was perhaps more effective in its disruption, which is, which is as we said before, is a, is a key aspect of mines, um, more than their actual um, number of ships sunk. Uh, the American submarines were fairly good at sinking ships anyway, um, but the uh, American mines would close major ports in Japan for days at a time. Um, Basically, the, the, the Japanese inefficiency at mine sweeping greatly amplified the uh, effect of American mines because if if a, if a mine had gone off, uh, say, outside Hamburg or outside Portsmouth um, or even outside New York, if, if ever such a thing did happen, um, American, German or British mine sweeping could have reassured everyone that there were at least some safe channels by the time the day was out. Um, the Japanese Navy couldn't do that, so a single American mine detonating outside a major port could shut that port or significantly cut the, the amount of freight coming in for days and days and days, which obviously um, had a significant effect on the Japanese war effort because as, yeah, they're trying to bring resources in from overseas, they're trying to export things to their uh, various island garrisons. Um, the, the, the slightly hilarious... Uh, footnote to all of that was that in terms of ships sunk and damaged the american mines actually probably did more actual damage to ships after the war um because there <clears throat> there were several tens of thousands of american mines still left after the war because the japanese mine sweeping efforts were so terrible um but even the u.s navy couldn't find them all um and uh, by about a year or two after the war, the US Navy just threw its hands up and went, you know what, stuff it, we, we cannot be bothered to find and sweep any more mines. Um, even though they knew there were well over 10,000 mines still unaccounted for, um, which then meant over the next few decades, um, several hundred ships of various types were damaged or sunk, um, either clearing them deliberately or accidentally finding one wandering around the ocean. Well, that's fairly interesting because I think, um, at least from uh, my standpoint, you know, sitting here in Germany and, um, you know, looking uh, mostly at the European theater, um, this is a rather unknown, you know, section of, uh, of the war that I didn't hear about. So that's very interesting. So I think um, up until the end of the Second World War, you could summarize mines as being cheap and just very durable in in terms of their effect uh, very frightening as an opponent um there were countermeasures but overall they were very cost effective um yeah so how was the development of mines after second world war up until 
this time? At which point did they become obsolete? Were they ever become obsolete? What's the situation? So obviously mine sweeping has gotten a lot better. Um, it's with the development, especially of active sonar, um, there's n there's no longer a, a need to just wander around as an area where you suspect a mine is and um, just sort of haul a cable or a mine sweep around and hope you find something. Um, so in that sense, mine sweeping efforts, especially in the very modern era with the rise of drones, have gotten very good. But at the same time, the ability to mass produce the sort of the simple contact naval mines, um, they've gotten so cheap as to be almost pocket change kind of weapons. And they're still used as they were sort of kind of originally invented for in the modern era back in the Crimean War against the bigger navies of the world. Um, do you think in, since World War II, um, there have been over a dozen American ships have been damaged or sunk by mines. And you think, well, given the sheer size of the American fleet during the Cold War and even today, how on earth do you sink over a dozen US Navy ships? And it turns out you can actually do that. But the, the best, the most effective way is relatively cheap mines because you don't have to risk your own ships um, being blown up by doing so. Um, Magnetic mines are still around because, uh, as we said earlier, degaussing coils are quite expensive. Um, so they've been used in various areas to varying degrees of effectiveness. Um, but we now also have a whole variety of much more expensive mines, but also much more lethally capable mines. Um, so the, the three that I think would probably be of the most interest to the listeners um, you've got the, the mobile mine, which is wonderful, because instead of having to sail up to the location where you want the mine to be, um, the mobile mine is effectively um, a slightly modified torpedo, and you can launch it from a submarine well away from your target area, and then the mine will take itself to its target location and then set itself up there. Um, so this this is this is a very easy way of mining... Um, some something like a, a channel or an estuary or a harbor something like that where whereas in world war one oh sorry in world war two the germans might have used aircraft to parachute the mines in obviously these days with surface to air missiles and stuff that's not necessarily such a good idea for long-term survival um, but if you have a really quiet submarine you can sort of motor up to 10 15 miles away from an enemy harbor and just fire a minefield into their harbor and there's not a lot they can do about it um, unless they happen to have an anti-submarine ship waiting just offshore, which obviously with the fact that even the US Navy is nowhere near the size that it was in World War II, it's fairly unlikely that they're going to have a ship specifically there at that specific time. Okay, how far was the range of those torpedo mines? Um, it depends on what torpedo you're basing it off of. Um, so the average to a sort of torpedo mine is, I say, probably safely between maybe seven or eight miles up to maybe 15 miles. But modern torpedoes can go a lot further than that. So if you were to, say, develop something um, based off of, say, the American Mark 48 ADCAP torpedo, you could probably fire it significantly further, um, <clears throat> probably in the order of... 20 30 maybe even 40 miles um but the, the the other two types of mines which unfortunately you still do have to physically lay um are another american invention which is the torpedo mine which is it's kind of we've been talking about the mobile mine this is kind of the, the other way around rather than firing a torpedo that turns itself into a mine this is you lay a mine that is actually a torpedo uh, which is perhaps the, the, the ultimate in long range torpedo, uh, long range mining. So this is uh, it's a, it's a torpedo in a case, and the case has a variety of sensors on it, whether that's acoustic sensors, magnetic sensors, etc. And the idea is that the, your casing keeps the torpedo away from the water, um, so it keeps it intact, and it monitors the surrounding area for the signature of a submarine or a ship, and then when it detects that and it's activated it fires the torpedo so it's a stationary torpedo launcher basically huh. um, that that's that that's quite the uh the nasty thing and those are air droppable if you happen to have air superiority as well which um it makes deployment quite quick 
quick and easy. <clears throat> the other type is the Russian equivalent, which doesn't fire a torpedo. Um, it sits on the bottom with a high-speed rocket in it, believe it or not. Um, it's not quite as long range as the torpedo mine, but it is quite lethal because the, the idea is obviously a ship sails nearby, it detects that this is the case and aims its little high-speed rocket and then launches it, uh, launches uh, effectively what amounts to a mi a mi an underwater missile um, straight up towards uh, its target, whether that be a submarine or a ship. The advantage that it has, well, and the reason it sacrifices the range, is that that impact is going to happen within seconds of the mine activating. Uh, whereas with a, a torpedo mine, although it's longer range, you can, in theory, detect the torpedo and take some kind of countermeasure, whether that's evasion or decoys or maybe even active countermeasures. Whereas obviously with a rocket mine, that's not possible. Well, it's kind of, oh, there's a rocket. Oh, I did. That's helpful. Yeah, so it's very interesting to which kind of degree people are innovative to uh, figure out how to kill each other in the cheapest way. Um, <laughs> so mm. then to a completely different question, because we are over the one hour mark by now. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's that's usually us talking, right? So um, yeah, <laughs> um, the thing about um, the why we talk about mines in the first place is um, to bring in some you know, how they were used, the um, development and origins to how cost effective they are. Now, to translate this into War Thunder, the actual gameplay, I kind of, at the moment, have some problems with it. You see, if you have the mine, um, you know, swimming on the surface, uh, even if it would be stationary due to game mechanics, you can easily shoot it up. You know, you, you see it floating if you have your eyes open and you just shoot it up and um, then it detonates and it's been removed. But if you put it too deep underwater, you cannot really hit it. But then, um, especially patrol boats, let's talk about the contact fuse, just have, you know, no problem just um, sailing over them. And um, then you also have the timer of it being just active for a few minutes. And um, in particular, if I think about certain maps to, um, you know, throw them into the small channels where destroyer might enter a patrol boat area, you have to get there in the first place. And before that, you're mostly shut up by other patrol boats or you are facing the destroyers in, within their gun range in the first place. So what kind of gameplay can you kind of imagine i think it's very situational what's your opinion yeah it, it's it's going to be very situational i mean it's obviously war thunder ships are primarily concentrated around the world war ii era so you could see a number of types of mines used you could have obviously you've got the contact mines acoustic mines magnetic mines and pressure mines um I think the, the, the single biggest problem they're going to have implementing it is the fact that because so many of the, the ships at the lower tiers up until you get to destroyers are actually quite small, it means they're going to be very agile. So even if they spot a mine that's a couple of ship lengths ahead, they've probably got a reasonable chance of evading them, which obviously destroyer probably doesn't. Um, and also the ships that are laying them, being those same ships, are not going to be able to carry that many mines, which means that their effect is probably going to be more deterrent value than um, actual offensive value. It's going, to, it's going to be the same kind of thing as we were talking about actually in history, where if, if uh, a ship sees um, a mine, even if it detonates it, and obviously they can have a very short spotting range, um, but even if it sees a mine and, mine and detonates it, then you know that there's possibly another half dozen mines in the area, which in a game that you're actually trying to win, that may well influence your, that may influence you to either avoid that area or to proceed through it very, very slowly to avoid running headlong into a mine. Um, I think the, the two areas where mines are going to have the greatest effect are 
going to be in the kind of maps where you get a lot of ships all pinwheeling around in a in a sort of a very fast melee because then you end up with a lot of people in sniper mode they're focusing on their guns they're probably they're definitely not looking where they're going because they're looking at the enemy ships um in that kind of situation then mines are going to be a lot more effective because people as I said well they won't know they won't necessarily even know that they're heading straight for one until they detonate which is going to be uh, fun um the other thing the other thing probably i think is where i see them having the single greatest effect is probably going to be on maps with large open ocean areas where the destroyers spawn um mine layers that are blocking the most common entrances into the more confined areas with mines that is probably going to be the single greatest tactical effect you're going to see because obviously a a destroyer, a higher higher level destroyer like a tribal or a, or a Fletcher, with so many uh, sort of secondary and tertiary weapons, if it gets in amongst all the torpedo boats and there's a decent crew on board, can lay waste to a dozen smaller ships in a matter of moments. Being able to block your enemy from doing that by deploying mines um, is actually probably going to be a significant game changer, especially if you can stop your opponents doing the same thing to you. Um, because we, we all know that feeling. I'm sure anyone who's played the uh, War Thunder Naval Warfare Beta at this point, you all know that feeling when you've, uh, you've spent half the game slowly trundling your destroyer or cruiser in towards uh, some nice juicy uh, torpedo boats, and then somebody actually drops a torpedo into your hull, and all that just goes in for nothing because your ship is now gone. Um, now imagine that happening only without even... That sort of knowing that there was a particular enemy ship that did it to you <laughs> because you just hit a mine and that could have been there since the start of the game yeah therefore i think the mine will detonate after three minutes so that is also why i think it's very very situational i mean there are some locations especially in the, in the pt boat area around the capture zones where you could be really really nasty and just reverse around the corner, lay a smoke screen, and then just, you know, play the wounded easy kill and lay a few mines uh, within the smoke and then just uh, watch the kill feed getting ridiculous. So this is, yeah. uh, this is where I think uh, hilarious scenes might come from. So I think yeah, I mean, it's, um, yeah, continue. I was just, I was just going to say, yeah, contact mines are probably going to be best paired with smoke screens, as you describe, because then obviously that's going to cut down the visual spotting distance in in realistic or simulator event. If that eventually comes around, you're not going to see them at all. So that's that's going to be a big deterrent um, because at the moment you're charging through a smoke screen. Your biggest risk is you find there's more enemy ships on the other side than you thought, but. If if you go look at every if every smoke screen you look at may or may not contain some contact lines, that, that's going to significantly increase the power of the smoke screens as well as the effectiveness of the mines. Um, the other thing I'm thinking is that if you've got um, magnetic or pressure or acoustic mines, that could actually have a much more interesting tactical effect because those mines could be completely under the water, so you don't you wouldn't be able to spot them at all. Um, but especially with something like a pressure mine, you could end up in a situation where the pressure mine will only activate if a ship is coming past at a certain speed or above. So that might cut down a bit on the sort of on everybody tearing around at flank ahead all the time. Because why not? Um, because if you know that actually, if you proceed at two thirds ahead instead of full ahead, you won't detonate pressure mines that may or may not be in the area. <laughs> that might actually help slow the action down a bit and make people play a bit more tactically mm. last question is um when you think about perfect weather conditions could you potentially see mines from uh, a plane and give you a team warning in chat or you know uh, a squad member in particular that you are on voice com with that would probably actually be the easiest way to spot mines i would think um, historically, mine sweeping, at least for some mines on the surface in shallow waters from aircraft, is actually much easier than from the from the surface. Because obviously, on the surface, uh, 
um, as you do get in War Thunder, you get this kind of, you've got waves, you've got all sorts of things that disrupt how far you can see. Whereas if you're looking down, it's a relatively uniform surface and then, oh, look, there's a dark spot. That's a mine. That's, that's easy enough. Um, so, yeah, I think aircraft as minesweepers, um, or at least as being able to spot and designate where there are mines, that's probably going to be a fairly useful tactical um, sort of synergy between the, the aircraft and the ships. And who knows, you might, with that, with that in mind, if they do bring magnetic mines into the game, that might even induce Wargaming to bring in the, the, the gigantic UFO Wellington <laughs> to see if they can do some automatic minesweeping, which would be absolutely hilarious. Yeah, flying at low altitude over the, you know, the um, PT boats that all try to shoot you down. I think that's that's going to look, uh, you know, not just hilarious, but also it's more even more hilarious that this comical picture will make sense from a tactical standpoint. So I think we yeah. have exceeded an hour quite comfortably. Um, that was actually our first talk, our first attempt to record this, which um, I'm kind of proud of to have achieved this. Um, I think that's the end of our, well, you can call it interview or discussion. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I thoroughly enjoyed it. And um, again, a big shout out to your channel where you have such uh, video titles named The Dry Dog, where you answer questions and the five minute guides to ship classes or ships in particular, which are highly interesting. One further thing that I want to add to this, it seems like that you know everything about ships and even more. And to pick out a certain, you know, argument or a certain aspect, um, you know, that you, you just read once in a book or on the internet is something completely different than to ask a person that has the um, overall knowledge in his own brain, knowing how to judge it. And this is why it makes it for me personally, very interesting talking to you. So again, thank you very much. And um, I hope that we can kind of um, do this again. If you are interested about, you know, other topics, certain ships, uh, certain other technologies like, you know, torpedoes, for instance. So um, that's it all for well, now you can say something at the end. Yeah. Yeah, well, thank you very much. I enjoyed it. And um... Yep, I I definitely like to do this again. Um, it's it's always fun to meet meet and talk with other people who are interested in naval history and um, uh, and well as as anyone who who's uh, studied naval history will know, there's an awful lot to learn. Um, there's an awful lot to know, and there's always always going to be disagreements about certain things, um, differences of opinion, different interpretations of historical fact. Um, so the more the more people who can get involved in the discussion, whether it's uh, here in the comments on this video, whether it's uh, comments over on my channel, it's all good. And uh, we, you can always learn something new. That's that's the important thing, um, especially especially when with the, with the kind of subject that we're talking about. Um, Although, unfortunately, a lot of the of the actual people who who fought in World War Two are now passing out of living memory, there are still a lot of people around um, from all sides who have had fathers or grandfathers or other relatives who have actually done this for real. Um, they've they've fought against mines. They've maybe laid mines. They've conducted all other kinds of uh, um, activities related to naval warfare. And there's a, still a lot of people who value um, those experiences and those stories and being able to spread the knowledge and spread the the information around, hopefully bring some of those people uh, to, to share their experiences and, and we're all, in, all the better for it. Yeah. So again, thank you very much. And um, now it's down to the few surviving subscribers of mine that are watching this video by now <laughs> because um, it's like, you know, um, 70 minutes, 80 minutes, we're going into this kind of realm. Um, yeah, so that's it also for me. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Let me know in the comment section what you think about this. If I should do more of those long episodes, do you want to have shorter bits? And um, do you think this topic is interesting? Not just talking about the, the game itself, but also the technical origins, the design process, and also their huge 
in um, their use rather in um, you know the world wars interwar period or um, post world war ii so let me know that and as usual give this video a like if it did subscribe if you want to see more don't forget to check out drakini files channel again link in the video description down below and we'll see each other on the waves of war thunder Thank you.